Hello and welcome to yet another lecture for History 2. And in this lecture, I want to talk generally about the basic components of the Industrial Revolution in Europe. And then to turn our attention to the question of why the Industrial Revolution comes, when it does, and where it does. Why is Britain the first industrial nation? How is it able to assume the leadership in this economic process that would change the shape of Europe and the world? In passing, I've talked about cultural developments and that it's difficult to talk about specific dates, that there are trends, developments that are stretched out over the course of time. Certainly, if one thinks of a revolution as a short burst of violent revolutionary activity, which results in a very quick change, then one can't really talk about an industrial revolution. This is something that's stretched out over decades, and yet its implications are indeed revolutionary. We can say with some certainty that the Industrial Revolution begins in Britain around the middle of the 18th century. By the end of the century, Britain would be in the throes of a profound economic transformation, well on its way to becoming the first industrial nation. By 1851, Britain would have emerged from the pack, as it were, as a major European power, indeed a major world power, in a way that it really had not been before. I want to talk then about the ways that one can approach the Industrial Revolution. What are its components, the phasing, and so on. During the 18th century, a series of inventions transformed the manufacture of cotton and created a fundamentally new mode of production. The emergence of the factory system, as it came to be known, would be based on three principles. Firstly, the substitution of machines for human skill and effort. Secondly, the substitution of inanimate for animate sources of power, especially the introduction of machines for converting heat into work, opening to man a new and almost limitless supply of energy. Man would no longer be dependent upon wind, water, or animals to provide the energy for production. And thirdly, the use of new and far more abundant raw materials, in particular the substitution of mineral for vegetable or animal substances. We're talking about coal. Coal as a source of heat. Coal as a source of energy. The burning of coal, the combustion of coal, becomes a major driving force in this industrial transformation. This improvement yielded an unprecedented increase 
in man's productivity and a substantial rise in per capita income over the course of this period from a, a period of 1750 to 1850. In the past, increases in economic opportunity had always been followed by a rise in population, which eventually consumed the gains achieved. Economic possibilities would expand then the population expands, overcomes those opportunities, and one moves back into this cycle. But in this period from 1750 to 1850, for the first time, both economy and human knowledge were growing fast enough to generate a continuing flow of investment and technological innovation. In this period, one has a sense, for the first time, of a concept that we now talk about all the time, sustained growth. What does that mean, sustained growth? This had been something that was beyond the pale of pre-industrial economies. It was this self-generating growth based on technological economic innovation that con constituted the basis of the Industrial Revolution. This ongoing revolution fundamentally altered economic life in Europe and indeed the world. It revolutionized social organization and social relations. It transformed the balance of power between nations in Europe and between civilizations. It is the success of industrialization that would, along with the French Revolution, really distinguish Western civilization from other civilizations around the world. It would become an inherent part of the way that European or Westerners would define themselves. Enlightenment thought, the Industrial Revolution, the politics arising out of the Enlightenment via the French Revolution. If the French Revolution can be said to have ushered in a new age in politics, the Industrial Revolution has had an equally profound impact on human history. Having just said it's impossible to find nice, neat dates around which to make an argument about industrialization, there are a few things that one can do, as in the case of talking about literary products that you can find the publication dates of philosophical tracts, books, and so on. With industrial development, one can pinpoint the dates of inventions, and this is usually the way this is approached. In the 18th century, in England particularly, in the manufacture of cotton, one can list the inventions that transformed that important economic sector and then would ultimately transform all of European economic activity. In 1733, the hand loom was invented. It cut the time of weaving in half. In 1770, the water frame, which used water to spin many threads at the same time, also vastly increased manufacturing. A year later, in 1771, the first 
water-driven factory with almost 600 workers. By 18th century standards, an enormous enterprise had been created. In 1778, the Spinning Jenny was created, which also vastly speeded up the process. Then, in the 1770s, perhaps the most important, James Watt's steam engine, which would dramatically accelerate production, but also change the ways in which production was organized. Once you have steam engines, you have an energy producing machine. That energy producing machine, like the steam engine, becomes a central organizing force of production. So you organize around the machine. It means one can see the beginnings of how machines come to dominate the workplace. But I don't want to dwell on the technology, except to note that in the English case, that these inventions were the products of tinkerers. They were of individual entrepreneurs working to try and solve very pragmatic problems. They were not the products of the schools of science that one found, for example, in France or in Prussia, which also was dedicated to finding new ways of solving these problems of energy and work. But why did this spurt of economic and technological activity occur first in Britain? Why did it become the very first new nation? If one were predicting around the middle of the 18th century, which of the various European countries was going to take the lead in a dramatic new economic development, it certainly would not have been England. It most likely would have been France. France was a more populous country. France had a larger overseas trade in the middle of the 18th century. It had a larger manufacturing base in the 18th century than did England. And yet, France would not become the first new nation. Its focus would be, as we've seen, its great achievements, its contributions, would be political in the French Revolution. The first continental industrial state in Europe would be Belgium. France would not become the first industrial nation, despite all of the advantages that it had. There are many factors that prevented this. One was revolution and war. France was convulsed from 1789 down to 1815 with domestic turmoil, war. As a consequence, this was not exactly the most congenial environment for investment in thinking about long-term investment in particular. The impact of revolution and war would play a role. There's something else that one has to say, too, about the nature of the French Revolution and the accomplishments of the revolution. One of the reasons that one could argue that France does not play a greater leadership role in industrialization is the very success of land reform 
during the French Revolution. In England, one of the key ingredients of success was having a large labor force, a labor force freed from working on the land that would be able to work in these cities of the late 18th and 19th century. But in France, the very success of land reform, the redistribution of property, would keep the peasantry on the land. There was no great driving need to leave the land to move into these growing industrial centers. So that played a role. The Napoleonic Code added a punctuation mark to this by ending primogeniture, so that younger sons of peasant families didn't have to leave the land to go in search of some sort of livelihood, but could remain on the family land. What the revolution manages to do in France is to create, or encourage at the very least, a growth of an independent, land-owning, French farming class, a peasant class, that would certainly be a key to thinking about the success of French agriculture over the 19th century, but would not create this mobile labor force to go into the cities. There's another factor, too, that needs to be mentioned here, a curious one. At the end of the 18th century, one can see the first signs of a relative decline in the growth rates of the French population. France, in the middle of the 18th century, was the most populous country in Europe, west of Russia. But whereas the rest of Europe experienced an enormous population explosion, in France, the population would only just grow. By the end of the century, a declining birth rate was a major concern in French political life. It meant that there wasn't the excess population to move into the cities. Finally, I would say this too. France had a very long and very successful tradition of producing luxury goods. The great court life of Louis XIV, of the elaborate sort of consumption that one saw at Versailles, and kept up by the French aristocracy, was something that encouraged the production of luxury goods, which, by definition, are not mass-produced. But what about Britain, then? If we can talk about why not France, why Britain? There are a number of factors that we should address, beginning with the most obvious. It's impossible to talk about almost any development in England, or Britain more broadly, without coming back to geography. England is an island. That separation from the continent had meant that in this great period of almost constant warfare from the 17th century into the early 19th century, England was largely free from the disturbances of war. It's hard to overestimate the importance of that consideration. It meant that there was greater security for investment. If one reads the novels of Jane Austen, set in the midst of the Napoleonic era, 
novels like Pride and Prejudice, Sense and Sensibility, one would never have any idea that wars are going on, or that Britain has been fighting the armies of the French Revolution and Napoleon for well over a decade. In addition to this greater security provided by the island nature of Britain, the deeply indented coastline of England meant that it was ideal for harbors. No town in England is more than 80 miles from the coast. Goods could be moved with greater ease than anywhere on the continent. Overland travel, overland trade, was painfully slow. It was dangerous. It was unpredictable, even in France, even in Prussia. The river system in England was augmented in the 18th century by canals and turnpikes, particularly a burst of construction between 1760 and 1780, which joined the major commercial and manufacturing centers. So it was much easier to move goods by water in England than anywhere else in Europe. And, of course, the island stature of Britain meant that it was, by definition, far more sensitive to international trade. It lived, in a way, by international trade. Finally, it's a small landmass. It made the creation of a national market much easier. If one thinks about France, you think about France without modern transport. It's a very large country by modern European standards. Creating a national market without easy means or modes of transportation was not so easily accomplished. In addition, there's the political system. England had been a unified state from a very early date and had removed internal tolls and tariffs, which in the large countries on the continent took an incredibly long time to do. In England, that had already been accomplished by the middle of the 18th century. This unified state was also conducive to a sense of a national market. One can think not in terms of Brittany or Provence. One thought of England, or even larger, of Britain as a possibility of a market. Also, Victory by the nobility and the gentry in the English Civil War of the 17th century meant that Parliament was involved in making policy, and the interests of the English nobility and gentry were in crucial ways different from those of their counterparts on the continent. Parliament since it would in the Glorious Revolution, the English Civil War of the 17th century, thwart the efforts of the Stuart monarchy to create an absolute estate. Parliament helped to make decisions. Parliament was dominated by the aristocracy, which would have connections to trade. So that was extremely important. The English nobility had interests that were, in crucial ways, different from those of their counterparts 
on the continent. We've alluded to this before, but it's extremely important to come back to it. The English social system was by far the most open of any of the European countries. Part of that was the result of the peculiar role of the institution of the gentry, or the lower nobility. Because of the failure of absolutism in Britain in the 17th century, there were no other career options for younger sons of the aristocracy. They didn't have the option of going into the standing army positions in the royal army. There was really no standing army to speak of in England. Similarly, the failure of the Stuarts to create an absolute estate meant that there was very little in the way of a national bureaucracy or civil service. So younger sons of the aristocracy looking for acceptable careers did not have these options open to them which is what one found in Germany, in Italy, and in France. Primogenitor, as we've indicated, the elder son inheriting the estate, the title. The younger sons would then do what? In the English case, they tended to become involved in one way or the other, with business ventures. Not directly, but they were far more likely to become involved in international trade, far more likely to intermarry with commoners, something that was very frowned upon on the continent and didn't happen all that much. But in England, Intermarriage between younger sons of nobility and wealthy commoners was not so uncommon. What this did was to create a new influx of money, of energy, into the aristocracy, and made it also far more sensitive to the needs of business. The middle classes of England were not as bound by guild restrictions. Those had eroded for the very reasons that we've already been talking about well before the 18th century. Where they lingered, entrepreneurs simply resorted to what was called the cottage industry, or sometimes known also as the putting out system in which they would provide looms and cloth and peasants in their cottages outside city walls, would produce, unrestricted by guild regulations within the towns. This made for a far more market-oriented business climate, a far more market-oriented business community. The other thing here that's important is business organization. On the continent in the 18th century and early 19th, the tradition of family businesses, where there was very little distinction between the honor of the family and the business, had slipped in England. It is England that would pioneer the Limited Liability Corporation. And that's extremely important. A limited liability company can do things that a family business might think was not acceptable, might be even slightly dishonorable, or at least seen as unpalatable, but not if that liability or responsibility 
was shared out amongst many others. And finally, there's the long tradition of international commerce, which made everyone in England sensitive to the possibilities of trade. The demographic factors that we've alluded to before, this massive population growth in the late 18th century and the early 19th century, was also very important. It led to a vast expansion of trade and created a huge domestic market in England, not for luxury goods, but for cheap standardized items that could be mass produced. A national market that is ready for precisely the type of item that can be produced in this new factory environment. The standard of living in England was also higher, relatively high, higher than that on the continent. The costs of labor were higher, and this would spur technological innovation to get around higher labor costs. So that one of the reasons that you find the tinkerers, the entrepreneurs, out in their proverbial backyard, trying to find a way to build a better mousetrap, was to get around the problem of high labor costs. Foreign factors would also play a role. Great Britain enjoyed a considerable colonial empire, and hence access to cheap raw materials, and the potential of vast markets. So should there be a downturn in the domestic market, there was always the possibility of foreign investment, sales abroad, and so on, in a way that the continental countries, France being almost the only exception, could not even conceive of. This was certainly not an option for any of the German states, for Russia. And the nature of these foreign markets would be, of course, that it would be quantity, not quality, of what was produced. The very same type of mass-produced articles, cotton goods, could be sold abroad cheaply. All of these factors would place England at a critical position to become the world's first industrial nation. Between the end of the Napoleonic Wars in 1815 and 1855, England would very clearly emerge as the industrial leader, the new economic leader of Europe, and indeed the world. Up until this point, England was certainly a major power, a major player in all of international politics, certainly a prosperous country. But England would make a quantum leap forward. England would emerge from the pack, as it were, to stake its claim for leadership in Europe. And it would be a leadership not based on enormous armies, not based on constitutional changes, the revolution, the advancement of these great revolutionary principles that one saw in France. It would rather be on the far more pragmatic area of economics. In 1851, the famous Industrial Fair, the most important of these that would come to be a fairly standard thing of industrial fairs in Europe, was staged in London. It was the unveiling of what was called the Crystal Palace. This was a great industrial fair, an opportunity for England 
to show to the world all of the great creations that industrialization and industrial capitalism had produced. England was now the showcase. It had become, as many people put it, the workshop of the world. If France had the storming of the Bastille as its great symbolic act, the mounting of the Crystal Palace was, great, was Britain's great symbolic achievement. It wasn't the Bastille, this symbol of repression and despotic government under the old regime, but this new, bright, airy, extraordinary architectural achievement, the Crystal Palace. Economic change catapulted Britain to the position of preeminence and economic affairs in Europe, and it would also become the basis for its staking its claim to political leadership of Europe and perhaps the world as well. Let's take a quick look at uh, some of the various different economic theories that were prevalent during this Industrial Revolution. There are three basic types. The classical, though the individuals who espoused these classical ideals generally referred to themselves as liberals. And then there are the liberals themselves, and lastly, the utopian socialists. The classical theorists were generally self-made men of limited means, who had worked hard to achieve what they had. So they generally felt very little sympathy for those who tried to take from them what they had worked so hard to achieve. And they often favored, therefore, this idea of laissez-faire, that the government should leave capitalism and industry business alone for them to be able to fend for themselves, to allow the strong to survive. There are several proponents of this type of economic theory. Adam Smith, for example, a Scottish philosopher, wrote a number of works, so perhaps the most important for us with the economic theories is his Wealth of Nations, published in 1776. Within it, he stated that economics, like the physical world, had its own laws, that the most basic of these laws was supply and demand. He also believed that if left alone, these laws would keep the economy in balance and, in the long run, would work to benefit everyone. He believed in the sanctity of property and contracts, believed that competition and free enterprise would provide incentives and would help to keep prices down, believed that government should basically leave businesses alone except to encourage private enterprises into less profitable but necessary businesses. At first, the machine owners generally really loved this idea, but eventually they came to realize that they could gain even more if they could convince the government to protect them. We also have Thomas Malthus uh, in his work, An Essay on Population, 
published in 1789, he stated that population increased in geometric ratio, whereas food supply increased by arithmetic ratio, meaning, of course, that population would eventually outstrip food supply. And that, of course, this would mean starvation and a reduction of the population down to levels where the land could feed the people. But that population then would then increase, and this back and forth action would occur continuously. But he also believed that nothing could be done about this or indeed that nothing should be done to improve the lot of the people. Because if you improved their lives, if you made it easier for them, better for them, they would simply, if they had more food, they would produce more children which would lead to a far quicker outstripping of their resources, their available resources, and you would have mass starvation again. The only thing that held this back from occurring in massive amounts was poverty. People who are too poor to be able to afford more children will have fewer children, and therefore it will keep the population down. He also believed that the rich were not to blame for the misery of the poor, and that the poor are the ones who are responsible for their own plight in life. From there, we also have David Ricardo in his work, Principles of Political Economy and Taxation, published in 1817. He is the father of the idea of the Iron Law of Rent, the Iron Law of Wage. Specifically, he said that rent is determined by the difference in productivity of land. Poor land goes out and lowers the cost for rich land. Therefore, England's corn laws, which maintained the price of grain at an artificially high level, should end. so that while it was of benefit to the poor so that they could afford grain, but also of benefit to farmers so that they didn't go out of business if there was too much grain one year or too little the next, so that the price was stabilized, that this should be removed, that it interfered in the marketplace and the Iron Law of Wages, stipulating that the natural wage should be a subsistence-level wage, just enough to keep individuals fed, housed, and clothed, but not so much that it would raise their ability to have a surplus because when they feel they have a surplus, they will then spend beyond that. They'll say, oh, I have this extra. I can do a little something more. I can have another kid. So in effect, if you raise their wages, all you will do is eventually cause the workers to sink down below the subsistence level. 
So keeping it at subsistence level is actually better for them. Then we have Jeremy Bentham, whose work, Principles of Morals and Legislation, published in 1789, believed that what was useful was therefore good. This is also sometimes known as utilitarianism. He believed that the chief purpose of government and society was to achieve the greatest good for the greatest number. He also believed that every individual is the best judge of their own self-interests. Therefore, the surest way to achieve general happiness is to allow each individual to follow their own self-interest. Individualism, according to Jeremy Bentham, was the best safeguard of the general welfare. Then we move into what are today known as the liberal economic theorists. These were individuals who were a bit later in time, generally, than that of the classical economic theorists, and therefore they had come to see for themselves that the Industrial Revolution had brought problems with it that needed to be fixed. First you have Simone de Sismondé, who believed that the power of the machines had interfered with Adam Smith's laws by glutting certain markets, thus oppressing labor and creating monopolies. He believed that the true wealth of a nation lay in the equitable distribution of goods and benefits amongst its citizenry. Therefore, that laws should be created to uh, restrict monopolies and to divide up large fortunes. So the creation of inheritance taxes. He also advocated uh, profit sharing and long-term job contracts. John Stuart Mill. He didn't really reject private property, capitalism, or free enterprise, but believed that there should be some restrictions in order to protect the poor. He believed, for example, that there should be some public utilities, that those businesses that are natural monopolies, like uh, railroads or uh, water works, gas companies, things of this nature, that these were things that should be owned by the state. He also believed in free compulsory education for all, and that child labor should be regulated, and of course in an income and inheritance taxes as economic equalizers. And then we come to the so-called utopian uh, socialists. Mostly these were individuals who had speculative dreams. What if we did this? What would happen? They really didn't have any practical course of action for the immediate present. They had ideas that they wanted to put forth, and very often these ideas did not really congeal with reality. So we have um, Henri de Saint-Simon, that should be an S there rather than a D, my apologies. Saint-Simon, 
who believed that society should be reorganized on a Christian basis, that we should all look out for the welfare of our fellow man. And the inheritance of private property should be abolished. He believed that uh, superior artists and scientists, engineers, businessmen should be rewarded for their superiority, but that everyone should be paid to be allowed to continue to exist comfortably, regardless of their abilities. Charles Fourier believed that economic competition should be done away with. He believed that competition was a source of evil. He believed that uh, profits should be based on a formula where the workers got the largest share. And supervisors and the uh, white collar workers, if you will, these individuals should be paid less because they didn't sweat as much for their work, I would assume. We also have uh, Louis Blanc, who believed that capitalism should be abolished and that instead there should be set up a system of social workshops where the government would uh, see to workers gaining employment. It would be government that would determine where people would go to work. They would determine what needed to be done, and they would determine what workers would do the work, and that type of thing. And indeed, his idea was uh, kind of uh, temporarily put together, and we'll talk about that later. But his idea will become so horribly bad, basically paying people to work by the government, and then if there weren't enough jobs for all of those who were looking for employment, that these individuals should still be paid the same as, or almost the same, as the individuals who are working, that this became such an enormous economic drain that it will cause huge problems that we'll talk about later. And we also have Robert Owen, who made a fortune in the cotton mills in Scotland and indeed will be one of the very few utopians who will actually set up a system to try and get their ideas to work, and he too will also fail. Raising wages, shortened hours, better working conditions, child labor abolished, educational and recreational facilities provided, uh, sickness, old age insurance, all of that type of thing. But it became so expensive that he basically had to abandon it or go bankrupt. All right, well, with that, I'll leave you with this lecture, and uh, we'll pick up again next time. Thank you.